we should never forget, but we do. We should never allow someone else to direct our lives, but we do. We should not turn our backs, but we do. Why? For the acceptance of someone or some group? For the smile of a loved one? For the feeling of love? Maybe. Maybe we forget because we have lost our first love. We have forgotten what truth and integrity and hope and joy and peace truly are. We have become complacent with our disciplines and have built our lives on sinking sand. Maybe it's just that simple. Many believers live their lives in the middle of sin. Living with someone outside of wedlock, having sex outside of marriage, drink, drugs, and oh, I love this, they fill their minds with the thought that it's only social drinking, <coughs> social drugs. I laugh out loud at that. You see, because I've seen social drinkers yeah, in car wrecks, I've seen social drug users cause bodily harm. I've seen ministries destroyed because of social drinking and social drugs. Interesting. Satan has commandeered the minds of many believers. And I feel sorry for them. So many believers come to ministers across the land lamenting on how their lives are in such bad shape and that they are mad at God. How about the reality that God will not bless you if you're living inside of sin? He loves you and He cares for you, but you are the one who has turned your back on Him. You are the one that has decided your way is the best way. And now you come and make the statement that you are mad at God because your life isn't going well. Wow. Really? You have allowed Satan and society to conquer your mind and you are not thinking like a Christian. So here's my word to everyone here. We should never forget that being a true follower of Jesus Christ includes living for Him and not for yourself. Obeying His word and commands, not the world's. Allowing Him to lead you, not being led by others. Being in constant worship of the one true God and growing spiritually day by day. It's that simple. And if you're confused at anything that I've said so far, then you're not listening. And if you're confused, then you're allowing Satan to confuse you. Because everything that I have said there, I understand. And I believe is true. In fact, I know it is. It's that simple. But boy, oh boy, some of you make it so daggone difficult every day because you won't listen to God, you won't obey Jesus, and you won't live for Him. So I ask you the question, because this is it. The title of the sermon is The Day is Near. So I ask you the question. What would happen if Jesus would come back right now or later today and find you living the life you're living? Would God be happy with you? Let's pray. Father, your beginning, and I agree with it. And I hope that everybody's mind is thinking on you. I pray that you have grabbed their attention so that your sermon will help each person in here live their life that you have given them. God, I pray for their soul. When I pray for the believer who is already going to heaven, but the believer who is going to heaven but not living right, may you bring him or her back to a straight, focused vision of your word, your ways, and have them obey you. God, teach us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray and all God's children said, Amen. I'm going to be working with a letter that Paul wrote the Christians in Rome. <clears throat> now, 
we have to at least set it a little bit. He was writing to the Christians in Rome, and he was writing to a community which felt very much like an oppressed minority. In many ways, Rome was a secular city consumed with financial and political concerns. But Rome was also a very religious city. Its pagan religion centered around Jupiter and other little g-gods and included many superstitions. Wow, that, those three, four sentences right there sounds just like the United States of America. Exactly like the United States of America. Who are the oppressed minority? Christians. If you don't believe that, then you're not reading. You're not, not just reading scripture. You're just not being involved with what's happening in our world today. We are the oppressed minority. Amen. And it is a shame, but it has happened. And inside of that, uh, the United States is a, a city in itself. Put it all together. A big city. Different components. Religious? Yeah, because they believe everything. By genius, we can find people in America that will um, bow down to the iPod, an iPad. We will find them that will bow down to an athletic team. We will find them that believe in the trees. I mean, I can go on and on and on. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but I'm trying to bring it to you right in front of your face. Because this description of Rome fits our description of what we live in today. See, in Rome, the Jews and the Christians who insisted on one God, big G God, were viewed as atheists. Because they denied the existence of all the other deities. And during this time, Emperor, Emperor Nero's reign included hunting down, torturing, and killing Christians. Nero's terror was very real. Many had to choose between the emperor or Christ. And those choosing Jesus often died for their faith. Now, we're not in that situation. There's not too many Columbines. You don't have to choose between life and Jesus. Oh, but wait a minute. If you die without Jesus, you still live. But you live in the lake of fire. And I don't think you want to live there. Nobody does. You understand me? If you're sitting out there without Jesus and you die going home, you, my brother, my sister, will be ushered into the lake of fire, the final judgment. So there is a big choice here. See, if you choose Jesus and, and you die today, tonight, whenever, I mean, guess what? You're going to be in heaven with him. Now, there's two places. Everybody lives in one of them. It's very, very scriptural. Here it is. Heaven or the lake of fire. Period. That's the only two places. Bingo. That's it. Bam. So, yeah, maybe so. When Paul's letter was written to these Christians in Rome during this very agonizing time, he wrote encouraging writings that were well received and necessary to assist the believer to stay the course, hold strong to Jesus no matter what. And the same can be said of God's word to us today. Would y'all like to join? Thank you. This is where we receive our direction, God's word. Our strength, God's word. Our encouragement, God's word. So hear God this morning. Romans chapter 13, 11 to 14. Paul writing. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let's put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the word throughout our sermon today. And he said in the very first part, and do this, dot, dot, dot. And do this, dot, dot, dot. You know, God is telling us, okay, things that are coming after this, do them. Okay, and he says, understanding the present time. And then he lists what to do. I, you know, 
These people were afraid for their lives. They were running for their lives. And we have no fear of losing our lives. However, we are running for our lifestyle, for our beliefs, for our faith. And in all of this, do you know what Paul is saying? He's saying, wake up! Wake up, Christians! And quit sleeping! It's the same today. We are, we are not awake and we are allowing society to lead us into the muck. And time and time again, believers are following others into the muck. And all God wants us to do is to wake up. Quit sleeping, he said. We're walking around, living our lives in a deep sleep, walking mode, and not allowing the words of Jesus to bring us to life. Folks, right now, there are so many believers across our world that are like zombies. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You know all the shows, Walking Dead and all that. Man, we're just out there walking and not following God. We're following everything back. You see, if you take the scripture in verse 11 and you go backwards, backwards to it, and you read what he has said, he has talked about love, to wake up and to share God's love. Paul has written down because God has told him to share that Jesus is coming back and we need to be found sharing God's love. In fact, we need to be morally prepared, spiritually alert, and diligently serving. Are you? Is your family? Are you doing something at work for God? You know, these are all things that are that. He said, quit sleeping and don't be in a spiritual coma. Oh my gosh. You know that guy that through the darks had gotten a fight that we prayed about? And when I went in there, he was in a coma. He was beaten half to death. And frankly, I didn't think he was going to make it. Saw a video of him, and I've talked to uh, Brandy a couple times. And even though he's back in the hospital, his son, their son, had not seen him. They had just talked over the phone a little bit when he started talking. And they surprised Todd with his son coming in. And it was pretty special. The boy was scared to death. And when he saw his father, it wasn't the stud that he has been. He's a lot weaker. He's been in that coma. And, and you could tell that he was frail. His voice wasn't as strong. But the love was there. If we're in a spiritual coma, we're weak. We're not getting any nutrition. Our muscles aren't getting stronger because we aren't doing anything which will allow us to stay strong, to be the man or the woman that God has called us to be. And, and Paul is writing, and Jesus to us, don't be, get out of this spiritual coma that for some unknown reason, most, and, and I'm going to use that word, and that's a hard word for me to use, most of the Christians are in it. And we're not doing anything about it. Spiritual lethargy. It, sin, sin becomes such a, a part of our lives that is tolerated and good works are not pursued and we're into that, that time period in our lives when Satan is smiling, Jesus is crying and we don't even know. And I'm asking you, my brother, my sister, to have your mind right now check you spiritually. How's your spiritual health? Are you asleep? Are you in a spiritual coma? Because Scripture tells us He's talking about Jesus coming back. Are you ready for His return? Scripture says, Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. The night and day. Now in Scripture, many places talks about the night and day. Folks, most of the time, do you... Do you the old adage, I don't know, I'll change it, but it's something like this. Nothing good ever happens after 1 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it really doesn't. And so many of our people in our society think that that's when the fun begins. 
Well, that's when the ungodly fun begins. The sinful fun begins. It's when bad stuff happens. And, and if you are single here and you say, well, that's when, you know, I, that's the only time I get to go out. Well, then don't go out. Get involved with something more than that. I mean, here it is. The night equals the present evil time. We are living in this time of night. It's the time of darkness characterized by Satan's evil work. And boy, is he working. Remember, who is in control of this earth? Satan. And we too often forget that. Satan is in control here. And what we need to do is to push him back and to grab a hold of God and to grab a hold of Jesus. The day means the time of Christ's return. And the day is coming, and it's coming soon. We just sang a song about it, and I love that song. The first time I ever heard it was at Camp Town about three years ago. Blew me away. And when you think about it, come, Lord Jesus, come. I'm sitting back there praying that He comes right now. I'm tired. I'm tired of wrestling Satan. I want to win. And I said we were in a fast food society mentality. I want to win Jesus. I want to win now. Come back now. Okay? Because I'm ready. I want to come back now. Anthony. I want to come back now. So everybody right here. Everything's taken care of. Everything's cool. Um... I want Jesus to come back now. I really do. Are there people in my family that would miss out? Yes, they are. Have I talked to some of them, most of them? Yes, I have. Do I want to talk to them again? Yes. But if Jesus came back right now, guess what? I'm ready. Are you? See, time is running out. Don't be caught with your pants down. Don't be caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Don't be caught living in the darkness of sin. And Scripture tells it. So, let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. I love that. That's a great picture. The deeds of darkness. The deeds of darkness. Hmm. Let us just get out of the muck. Let us live our life the way we're supposed to be living it. Let us truly quit sinning and knowing that we're sinning, and put it behind us. Get out of the muck, period. And put on the armor of light. Get rid of your evil disease and clothe yourself with the armor of right living. What a great picture. Now remember, in Rome all this stuff is happening. And it's as bad in Rome at this point as it is in our place today. You know, I, I still get the newspaper. I'm old school. I, I know I can get it. On my computer. I'm old school. And I, I used to just get one newspaper when there were two, and then they combined into Charleston Daily Mail stuff. <clears throat> and this week, while I was preparing this sermon, I sat down one time and started reading the newspaper. From Kiver to Kiver. <laughs> and as I read it, I just noticed <coughs> how many negative stories there were. Negative, negative, things happening, you know, uh, shooting here, uh, car crash here, always bickering between our two political parties, which covers 90% of the newspaper. I'm so sick of that. I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, I don't care. It's sickening. That, that was just a, that was a little side note, just so that you know. So, okay. But as I went through that newspaper, Negative, 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 negative. I stopped and I thought, okay, God, show me a positive. Show me a positive. I started going. And I will tell you that there was a positive. Hang on. Because the back session, I don't know if you saw it, was a huge article written on the new Shawnee Sports Complex. Anybody else see that? It was the whole almost section talking about the good stuff. Stuff for the kids to do. People are going to be here. The economic windfall. All that. It was great. And I looked at the paper. There were four sections. The main, the first front page section and the sports section were bigger than the other two. So I calculated. 
I was hoping 25% was going to be positive. I came out to about 17% because of this one huge thing about a sports complex. See, that's what we're, that's what we're getting. And we read that, we see it on the television, we, we see it in movies, we hear it on the radio. I mean, you know, if you're not listening to some positive, encouraging stuff on the radio, you're getting it in all aspects. So how do we put on the armor of right living? How do we do that? Ephesians 5, 8 through 10 says this, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. There it is. We were once living in darkness, and then we found Jesus Christ. He found us, and we found Him, and He became a part of who we are. And now you live in the light. So how do we do that? Goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then it says, and find out what pleases the Lord. Well, how are you going to find that out? Through prayer and through reading God's Word. That's how you're going to find it out. If you rely on individuals to tell you in every portion of your life what pleases the Lord, then you're going to get about 9 million different descriptions of what pleases the Lord. Right here. We'll tell you exactly what pleases the Lord. It's, it's in here. It's, it's you're truly in here. It really is in here. And if you have a relationship with Him, a true relationship with Him, then guess what? You're, you will not come up to me or some other minister across the country and say, you know, my life sucks and I'm mad at God. So we need to choose our behavior. We need to choose it. Each person who accepts Christ as their Savior and Lord chooses their behavior. There might be outside pressure, but we choose. There might be work pressure, but we choose. There might be family pressure, but we choose. If we chose Jesus in the first place, don't not choose Him now. Double negative. Don't not choose Him now. Make the only right choice. Follow Jesus. He says in that Roman passage, let us behave decently, as in the daytime. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. What He's saying is, let us behave decently all the time, and I'm calling it daytime decency. If I tell you that most of the negativity of bad things happen after dark, then guess what? I'm right. If we live as if we are living during the daytime hours all the time, then our life should be an open book. What we do should be able to be done in the open for everyone to see. We should embrace the fish Bowl lifestyle. Amen. Now I want to tell you, when I went into the ministry 20 some years ago, the first thing that Cindy and I noticed, and I've mentioned this to you before, is, oh, it changed. Really. When, a man, <laughs> when somebody comes forward and says, I'm going into the ministry, your life is seen by everybody. You're like that fish in the fishbowl. Just watch it in And at first, I resented it. I did. Because I didn't know how to handle it. Now that I'm old, ancient, I know, but I look good in this t-shirt. Um, I just come to the conclusion that it's just not ministers that live in a fishbowl. It's everyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because parents, your kids are watching you. They're watching everything you do. Students, other students are watching you. And if you claim to be a follower of Christ, if you wear the shirts and t-shirts, if you, you know, have all the stuff in your locker or whatever, guess what? And you don't. 
bad example. So, if that's the case, if we're all living in a fishbowl, we're all living in a fishbowl, that means everybody can see all that we're doing. It should be everywhere, all of them. Uh, it should be available for all to see. This daytime decency. Because the opposite is nighttime immorality. And this is the way Satan and the world wants you to live. Carousing and drunkenness. You know, I grew up with an open bar in my house. I could right downstairs. It was an open bar. It was uh, whiskey and all types of stuff there. I mean, it was just right there. I could have taken a drink anytime I wanted to. My mother and father uh, drank, drank a lot. And my older brother became an alcoholic. And out of all the five kids, I'm the only one who didn't drink. Amen. Well, thank you. That's great. It's God's power. But I didn't know what I was doing or not doing. And here's the deal. I was a jock. And being an athlete meant a whole lot much more to me than going out and getting drunk on Friday and Saturday night. It really did. My point being, I just never understood. I went to Marshall my freshman year. And that first week, we went down to the What's that thing called? Den? Or, I don't know. Some place. There's a bunch of freshmen. We all, yeah. And so we got some beers. And I drank a beer. God, that stuff is nasty. <laughs> I mean, it really, it just, it was, it was the first one I ever had. It was horrible. Okay. I sit there, but I wasn't, I wasn't finished, baby. I mean, I wasn't finished. Everybody drinking? Yeah, I took another one. And I took a third one. I drank three beers. And I thought, that is the nastiest stuff in my life. I will never put that in my to my lips again. And I never have, never will. That stuff is nasty. Horrible. Why do people consume that? Don't get drunk. We've got to run a park. Big party. It was just for everybody. Open cans everywhere. And this one dude that was on my floor gets drunk. And he's holding on to the tree while he's <laughs> letting it all come out. I mean, it just looks like, I don't know. Niagara Falls is what it looked like. And then he, I'm serious, he's hanging on to a tree. I'll never forget this. I am way off script, but that's, he's hanging on to a tree, and he finishes and he goes, ah. And I said, dude, and he said, more beer for me. And right over, got back into it. Carousing and drunkenness. God says, don't do that. I get back to social drinking. I get back to um, having sex with anybody. I, I, these are things that God says don't do. This isn't Mark. This is not Mark. Don't get mad at me. I'm just a messenger. And guess what? I believe it. Then it says sexual immorality and debauchery. Debauchery is excessive indulgence and sexual pleasure. Sexual immorality is doing anything that is not what God had intended for sexual purposes. That's what it is. I told you that when I was early in uh, my youth ministry career, I heard a young lady talk about who had gotten married, but talk about what she did on her honeymoon night. I have told this 29,000 times and I've told you. She's now married, four or five kids. Her husband's pastor in the WVBC. She handed him a white rose on their honeymoon night, their wedding night. Because she had saved herself for the man that God had chosen for her and handed it to him. <clears throat> Yet our society calls those people all kinds of names because they're not having sex with everybody. This pulpit is going to be God's pulpit for as long as Genesis Fellowship stands. And this pulpit will tell you what God wants you to hear. We need to be true to our spouses. 
we need to abstain from sex until we are married. And that includes even if you're engaged all the way across the world. We need to understand that this is what God has for us and for you. But Satan wins and the virginity factor is falling rapidly. Divorce rate is escalating through the roof. All the while, God is crying. Nighttime immorality, dissension and jealousy. You see, these are actions, activities, and attitudes that belong to the darkness. All six of those. They have no place in a believer's life. So write this in. A believer needs to be decent and true in everything we do. Decent and true in everything we do. It's that simple. <coughs> and I love this next line. For I did not write it. I wish I had. For believers, the surrounding darkness is no excuse for indecent behavior. If we are true and decent in everything we do, then that surrounding darkness will never invade us. We will never enter into it. We will live a godly life, a holy life, and one that is pleasing to God. Folks, here's the deal. Don't care what you did last night. Don't care what you did last week. I don't care what you did last month. Today's the day. February the 10th. It is the 10th, isn't it? Yes. February the 10th, 2019. We start this morning. We start this morning to be holy. We start this morning to be spiritually godly. We start this morning to live in the light. It is from there that we move forward. We ask God to forgive us if we have sinned in the past and He will wipe us clean and white as snow. But we have got to come from here and move forward. Because we need to clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of our flesh. You see, we need to clothe ourselves, to put Christ on, to let Him take control. It says clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is my major point today. If I went to you right now and said, who is Jesus Christ? 95% of you would give me an answer that says, he's my Savior. And he is, if you've asked him into your life. What does that say? Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, is your Savior and should be the Lord of your life. Jesus Christ should be the Lord and Savior. Lord. Lord is a term that we don't use enough. Lord is a term that people will push away. Lord means that I am going to clothe myself with Him and allow Him to take control of my life. He is my Lord. He is my everything. Not just my Savior. So we need to put on Christ. Jesus take control. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with his practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. We are throwing away the old and becoming new each and every day. Grab that. Each and every day we become new. Not just once. Each and every day. Because we are inside of living with Christ. We are allowing Him to be the Lord of our life. And if we allow Him to be the Lord of our life, our life changes, folks. Our life changes. The Lord of our life doesn't want anything negative to come into our body. The Lord of our life doesn't want anything that is satanic to enter into our realm. The Lord of our life does not want us to live in the darkness. He wants us to live in the light and to put on the armor of His light on us. The Lord of our life. So we allow Jesus to take control of our lives. Not just so that we can say, Jesus is my Savior, and that's what it is. Salvation gets us to heaven. Salvation is that first stop, uh, uh, start as we walk with Christ. It is the very first thing that we must do to start a relationship with Him. Then, it's all about Him being our Lord. As we walk with Him, it's all about growing in Him, allowing Him to direct our lives. 
In fact, I, write, I wrote down, where Jesus, W-E-A-R, where Him, in our lives. Ephesians 4, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self. Again, put it off. Which is being corrupted by the deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self, created to be like God. Everybody say, like God. Like God. Like God. Like God. In true righteousness and holiness. These are things that we need to grasp, need to understand, need to put on. We need to throw away the old, start today, put on the new, and walk away from the old. And be all about righteousness, holiness, and try to be like God. Don't be like Mike, as a commercial used to say, just be like God. And so if we're doing those things, if we are allowing Him to take control when we're wearing Jesus... Talk to Jesus. The more you read about Jesus, the more you're going to understand His words and actions in your life. And when the situations come, you will know what the proper way to handle it is. When someone comes to you with a concern or problem, you'll be able to walk with them and guide them in the ways of Christ. It's very important to integrate the words of God into your way of life. Um, not in every moment, every second scriptural thing. That hurts my head. If somebody tries that, that hurts my head. When somebody puts that on me, that hurts my head. Okay? But be able to talk it. I, I, you all know that I am not a great... Um, I can't memorize very well. And so I can't quote scripture like some other pastors can. That's a gift in my opinion. Maybe you can very well. But I know the meaning of the scriptures. And so I share them through that way. So, and that's what we need to do. We need to talk Jesus... And be Jesus with the skin on. You're the only Bible somebody's going to read. You're the only Jesus somebody's going to see. You're the only one that's going to be able to lead that person to the light. And you might say, I don't want that responsibility. <laughs> you can't discard it. Amen. You, you can't. There are people you have in your life that nobody else is going to be able to reach. And that is you. So how then, best news ever? I just think that that's one of the best themes we've ever had. And it makes sense to me. Share. Do the things. The, the day is near. If the day truly is near, if Christ's coming is getting nearer than it was before, then we've got to understand, let's not be caught doing something that is ungodly. Let's not be caught doing something because we're lazy. Let's not be caught doing anything that is not worthy of your time, energy, attitude, and attention. In a world filled with hate, we need to share God's love. In a country <coughs> torn in two, we need to be the encouraging voice. In a society that lives in the darkness, we need to be the shining light. We should never forget that being a true follower of Christ includes living for Him and not for ourselves. Obeying His word and commands, not the world's. Allowing Him to lead you not, and not being led by others. To being in constant worship of the one true God and growing spiritually day by day is that simple. But many of you make it difficult. You make it difficult every day because you won't listen to God, you won't obey Jesus, and you won't read his word, and you don't live for him. Paul wrote these words for those believers in Rome <coughs> under turmoil. And we must take it to heart and share to the ones that God is sending us to because it's our joy. what's right in God's eyes. And never allow anyone to drag you away from Him. I'll have to come back to this. Remember this. It's always your choice. Who will you choose to be the Lord of your life? Jesus 